just by way of background, I actually am relatively new to academia, so I, I'm a little bit of a uh, hypocrisy, I suppose, in my family, uh, because my, my mother is a PhD, but I was always a little anti-academia growing up, so I always gave her grief because I, I was one of those students that didn't like the traditional teaching and, and, and you know, just the, the, the constant um, lecture, and then I had to try to figure everything out on my own. So, so it's a little bit ironic that I'm in academia. My mom still kind of busts my chops a little bit about that. But um, I think uh, I, I did spend my career, I was 20 years out in the, in the high tech world. I worked for some, some pretty uh, well-known companies, IBM, Symantec, CA, Novell. So, so I, I've had some pretty good experience out there, and I've been a hiring manager in a lot of cases. <clears throat> and um, I come from the, the Novell days back where, when they were you know, kind of one of the early pioneers in the whole certification model. Uh, for those of you who are uh, old enough to remember the, the, uh, the Novell c and &E. I, was, I was one of the early CNEs. And um, there was a, as I, after I left Novell and got a little bit higher up into my career and began hiring some, some, you know, some of these IT professionals coming out of school and stuff, uh, we coined the term, many of you may be familiar with, the, the, the paper CNE. Uh, the idea of somebody who was able to pass a, cert, a certification exam, but couldn't configure their, their, themselves out of a paper sack. And so, so this kinda, there's kind of always been this, this love-hate relationship with certifications and, and, again, being a hiring manager. I, I liked seeing certifications on resumes, but sometimes I was a little bit skeptical as to whether I was getting a paper CNE or whether I was getting a real CNE, right? And so I think all of you probably are, are familiar with that idea. And so at the, I worked downtown here at uh, LDS Business College, and for those of you who aren't aware, LDS Business College is kind of the forgotten little stepchild of the BYU system, okay? Uh, the Mormon Church has, has uh, several schools, and we're the little tiny one that no one's ever heard of. BYU Provo doesn't even acknowledge we exist half the time, so even though technically we were part of the same family. Uh, <clears throat> but, but we have been able to, because we're small, we're able to do some, some fairly unique things. Uh, um, for those of you that, and I think most of you kind of come from similar size organizations that I come from, so hopefully you can relate a little bit. Uh, every time we visit with the folks from BYU Provo or BYU Idaho, uh, you know, they're always talking about how it's hard to change their momentum if they want to shift gears and, and stuff. It's like turning a big aircraft carrier. I'm at a little school. I can turn on a dime. Um, and also when we talk about employing our students, I don't need, you know, 30 employers to work with. I need like three. If I can get three employers and build a really solid relationship with them uh, and make sure that I'm teaching my kids what they need to know, I can build a really good pipeline. And we had a really good partnership with EMC here in Utah until Dell took them over. Dell kind of changed that a little bit. Uh, but with EMC, where they were hiring almost two-thirds of my grads every year. And it was just a wonderful pipeline, and we were able to customize our training just a little bit to fit what they wanted. And so, so it is kind of neat to be in a small school for that reason, because I can kind of customize what, what we need to do. The other challenge that I had was uh, when, when they first brought me on about five years ago, um, again, I was right out, of, right out of the business world, so I was new to academia, I had to learn all the new words, and I didn't even know what flipped classroom was when I started here. Um, but, sorry, my classes, this is my alarm to go teach my class, so I'm gonna turn that off and hope that my sub is showing up. Um, at the college, we have this idea of deep learning. It's kind of a new, uh, we have a new president that, that started about three or four years ago, and the real push that we're pushing at the college is this idea of, 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 of deep learning. Um, it, we refer to it really as subject matter immersion. And as you know, there's, there's always kind of a challenge, especially when you're talking about in technology, because there's such a drive to get these certifications that there's so much data we're trying to get into these kids. Like It's, it's a little bit like drinking from a fire hose. And so there's so much data coming at them that sometimes we don't take the time or we don't have the opportunity to get deep in anything. So it's like a mile wide and an inch deep kind of training because we need to make sure we cover everything in the certifications. Um, but with, with the model that we're doing at the college, we're trying to get this, this subject matter immersion. So that became kind of the dilemma that I was in when I was building out the courses. And again, when I started, there were like just three or four classes is all. And, uh, and I was supposed to build out this whole, the whole IT program. Um, I, right now I'm focused in cyber, but initially I was running kind of the whole department, which was basically just me. So um, the, the, one of the reasons that I love test out is because it really allowed me to scale. 
myself very, very quickly uh, because they provide a lot of the, all the data and the content which allowed me to then kind of focus about going deeper. So I wanted to just identify or, or point out when I'm talking about deep learning, this is, this is a methodology that we have at, at the LS Business College where we're trying to empower the students to kind of take ownership of their own education, right? That we don't want to just be force feeding them uh, data and say, here, regurgitate this when you go take the exam. We want them to actually learn stuff and, and, and so that when they go and sit for their interviews and they're talking to their, their potential employer and the employer says, well, <clears throat> you know, great that you got these certifications, what do you know? What can you do? We want them to be able to say, well, I configured this, I configured this, I set this up, I ran this, I did, you know, we did this, and, and, and have some actual experience that they, that they can talk about. So that's kind of the foundation of when I'm talking about deep learning, what we're, what we're shooting for. So this uh, uh, then, of course, becomes the huge dilemma that we have in education, is um, especially in IT, right? Because we're all t teaching IT classes. There's this, there's this temptation to focus so much on the certifications that we forget to go deep in anything. And so then we're stuck with this dilemma. Do I teach to the exam or do I teach to the job? And again, having come from the, from the business world, it was fairly easy to figure out when I'm interviewing some of these potential employees whether or not they were paper CNEs. I could figure out pretty quickly if I asked the right questions. Because they, yeah, they can answer a, a true-false question or a multiple-choice question, but if I ask them actually how to go configure DHCP, they're like, DH what? You know, and, and, and they weren't quite sure what, what to do. So, so this becomes the dilemma. And so one of the things is I'm trying to build out all these classes, and, and, and we ended up building about 30 classes over, over the last five years, uh, and test out was a huge part of this because it allowed me to scale this. It allows me in a way to kind of get both of these. So that was really my aim because there is value in these certifications. Clearly there is. And, and, and what I want is, is my students when they're coming out of the college, I, I tell them right from day one, I want you to put as many of these you know, pro certifications on your resume as you possibly can. And we, by the way, we use them all. Right? We're, we're a big test out fan. We use everything. Right? We use PC Pro all the way up to, to, the, um, to the routing and switching. I mean, everything, the security, we, everything. We're, I'm, I'm anxious to see these two new products because I'm already thinking of how I can plug them in. So we're huge test out fans because it allows us to kind of straddle the fence here and actually address both of these scenarios. Um, and so this really is, is what, we're, uh, what we're trying to deal with is, uh, again, going back to my experience in the industry, um, if they were paper CNE, they couldn't do what I needed them to do, which meant I still had to then start from scratch and teach them stuff. So, so I, I need to kind of address both, both scenarios. So that really becomes our dilemma. Now at the college, this is just kind of an insight into, into our model, right? So we have the, the, the say we, we want to, our, uh, every course has to uh, have a preparation thing. The students need to come prepared. The teachers need to come prepared. We have a teach one another mechanism, a ponder, prove. So these are just the, 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 the components in our curriculum. Every one of our components has to have something that they can prepare ahead of time to learn what, they're, what, the, what we're going to be talking about that week. Teach one another. We need to have some interaction. We need to have the students helping one another, OK? Teaching one another. We drive our students nuts because they'll ask the teacher a question, and, and we kind of tell our teachers, don't, don't answer the questions. We're pretty much, we're about 90% adjunct, by the way, at our school. So there's very few full-time faculty at our school. Uh, our accreditor gives us grief for that every, every year. But, but so we're very heavy on the, on the adjunct model. And so we just tell the adjuncts, your job isn't to answer all their questions. Your job is to provide an environment where they can learn and you guide them and lead them, but don't just be you know, giving them every answer. So it drives, it drives the students nuts, but they, they get the idea. I want to focus really kind of on this outer circle here. These, this is what we call the four eyes. So every class we do has to be immersive. It has to be in integrated, uh, meaning that it has to work with other classes, right? One needs to build on the next, one needs to build on the next. Um, it needs to be iterative. Uh, if we're teaching a technology in in one of our classes, we should teach it in a couple of our classes, right? So they hit, the, uh, and in fact, the test out uh, courses are a perfect example of that. We hit, we hit IP, you know, uh, IP subnetting in, uh, what is it, the, the client pro, in the networking pro, and in the server pro. So we hit it three times. That's iterative for us, right? So by the time the kids get through all, those, all three of those classes, they've done subnetting a little bit, okay? So it's very helpful. Uh, it needs to be interactive, obviously, with the lab sim that, that's built right into it. And, and it needs to be immersive. And so interactive and, and immersive 
are kind of the key things that I wanted to, to focus on uh, throughout the rest of my, my discussion here today. So obviously, I think most of you understand the flipped classroom idea. You know, back when we were all coming up, you know, the lecture, we go to school, and the lecture was what we did in class. The, the teacher, you know, expounded and pontificated for the whole time, and we sat there and tried to stay awake and take notes as best we could. And then when we get home, we try to do the homework, and if we remembered what she was talking about, we could maybe do the homework, and if we didn't, then we probably didn't do the homework, and, and there was really nobody to talk to when we were doing the homework. And so uh, by flipping the, the model, if there was a way we could figure out to do the lecture at home and do the homework in class, that would be awesome, right? And now with videos and with the way test out has built their, their, their uh, environment, of course, that, that's now possible. So, so that's, that's why we love the classroom model because you know, we, get, we get all this stuff, the simulation labs, well, I don't need to test out. You guys know what, what I'm talking about. But this, this stuff, lab sim becomes the homework. Honest, we, we don't really talk about test out during class time much. I mean, we'll, we'll, every once in a while we'll bring something up and we might address something. We'll usually take the first 30 minutes in class and just discuss you know, one of the key topics. But again, because I'm trying to get immersive, uh, if the student doesn't have a specific thing they want to talk about, I'll go deep into the topic that I think is most pertinent for that, for that particular section or that particular week. Um, but we really don't spend a lot of time in test out in class. That's their homework. And uh, the beautiful thing about, uh, about the um, simulation environment, of course, is they, we can still assess whether they're doing their homework, right? We've all had that student come up and said, I've spent hours doing this. How can you fail me? And I look up in the lab sim, I look up and say, yeah, dude, you spent like 10 minutes the entire semester. Stop talking, right? <clears throat> Drives them nuts. But we can see exactly how much time they're spending in the environment. So we, knew, we know whether or not they're doing their homework. So it's, it's, it's beautiful that way. So because of that, um, test out just becomes the homework. So we don't spend a lot of time doing that uh, in class. Um, that, of course, and, and the lab sim stuff is where they're preparing for the exam because that's the content and the information that they need for the exam. So that covers the prepare them for the exam part, right? But that then frees me up in class to go deep into stuff. Now, of course, I have to be very selective on what I can go deep in because I can't do everything. But this is where we can get that deep learning. And so in class, what we've tried to do is come up with projects that we can do either collectively or individually. So sometimes I don't even really care if they work together or not. Sometimes I want them to work together. But this gives us a chance to, uh, to, to, to go deep. And notice a couple, of, a couple of things here. Sometimes the exploration is as valuable as the end result. All right? My pr the projects that we do in class often, from an assessment perspective, are pretty binary. Either they did it or they didn't. I'm not as concerned with exactly did they learn this, this, and this. Um, a lot of the assessments, what I have them turn in is some sort of an executive summary, which they hate. But of course, you know, we all know IT people aren't known for their communication skills, and so we're trying to teach them how to be able to, you know, we emphasize, we do a lot of executive summaries, and the executive summaries are, can you explain a technical concept to a non-technical person? Sometimes your boss is non-technical, and so we need our kids to be able to explain, well, how did they configure a peer-to-peer -peer network, and what subnetting design did they choose, and et cetera, et cetera. And if they can explain that in an executive summary and put in some screenshots so I can kind of see what they've done, Again, to me, that's as valuable as whether they did exactly one thing, because test out's kind of catching the specific skill set, right? So I'm, letting, I'm trusting test out to catch those specific skills. What I'm really looking for in the projects is to go deep into something and have the kids explore. And some kid might say, I had no idea you could do peer-to-peer -to -peer -to networking like this. This was awesome, and I could actually share a file with that guy, really? I mean, you, know, you talk about it, but until they do it, they don't often get it, right? And, uh, and so, and, and another person, that might be a non-issue for them. They might be get totally excited about the fact that they actually got you know, TCP IP configured. So uh, it's a whole different thing. But uh, this, this is how, how that frees us up. Um, so like I said, sometimes we don't always require a spe specific result. Sometimes it's as much, I want the kids to get excited and interested in something, so we let them play a little bit. Okay. Again, the test out content and the homework stuff is catching all the details and providing all the content. What I'm looking for in my projects is exploration. I want to get the juices going. I want these kids to get excited about something, 
Right? There's nothing more dull than sitting in an IT class, some guy rambling about you know, binary uh, addressing. And, and it's just like, oh, what? And, and, and so when you get them actually say, look, you all have to build a peer-to-peer -peer network and you all have to figure out what subnet you're going to be on. Ready, go. And they're looking at you like, subnet what? And, and make them actually calculate and figure out what is the range of the subnet. Now they can go back into test out if they want and figure it out, but, but they have to do it. So anyway, so this is how we do this. We actually have these posters. I've got two posters I'm going to show you here. In our, I have two dedicated classrooms just for all the IT courses that we teach. Okay? And we begin the very first week of, of new student orientation saying, and I always go back to a personal experience that I had years and years ago at Novell when I was just naive enough to think that when my boss came up to me and said, uh, Spencer, I need you to, I've got five things here I need you to go configure. Uh, I was in charge of one of the, one of the networks, the, the, the servers, and the, the old uh, network, I think it was a 2.0 server, 3.0 server, I can't remember now. But, uh, you know, he said, I need you to configure the server to do this, this, and this. Give me about five things. I knew how to do the first two. The third one I'd heard of, and the last two I had no idea. And I was just naive enough to think, you know, right out of, right out of college, that if I told him I didn't know how to do those things, that he'd go get somebody else to do it. Silly me, right? And uh, he just kind of got this little smile on his face, tapped me on the top of the head, and said, oh, Spencer, you're cute. Um, this is why I pay you the big dollars. You figure it out. And then he kind of turned around and walked off. That was a huge moment for me, huge moment for me. I'm like, I got a what? And he just kind of smiled and said, you'll figure it out. And then he, again, continued on into his office. And I'm like, holy cow, what if I screw it up? And then, of course, all the insecurities come in. And I'm just like panicking, oh, no, what do I do? Well, I started asking around. And we didn't have Google back then. But you know, we started asking around. For, I, I figured it out. I figured out those last two things. And so that's kind of become my whole mantra now at the college. And, and we tell our kids right from the first week of new student orientation, we are not here to spoon feed you. you know, welcome to college. This is not high school. Uh, <clears throat> you're all big boys and big girls. Our job is to teach you how to figure it out. In fact, we also tell our adjuncts, this goes back to what I was saying earlier, we tell our adjuncts, our job is not to fix their problem. Our job, we can guide them and we can answer them questions, but they need to ask us the right question. If they're not asking us the right question, push back. And our adjuncts are getting really good at it. And, uh, and so this whole idea, so the, the, this poster is probably about, I don't know, it's pretty big, uh, three foot by two, or four foot by three foot, I think. And, and, and it's just figured out. So anytime we get a little bit, you know, something gets a little heavy in class and, 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 and we get the kid that just is getting tired of working on it, he just gets, you know, lazy and wants to just say, just tell me the answer. We just point to the sign and we just say, no, an IT professional has to figure it out. You don't get to just throw up your hands and go home at five, right? I mean, any of us have ever worked in an IT department, if the, if the server is crashed, it doesn't matter what time it is. It's got to be up and running by eight o'clock in the morning when the CEO gets here. So figure it out. And so this becomes our, this becomes our mantra. Uh, the other one is this. Um, we have a lot of students who um, come in and, you know, as a, as a two-year school, a lot of kids are just here to get their, their quick gen eds, the cheap gen eds, and then they're going to transfer up to the University of Utah or down to BYU or somewhere else. And so they might take a technology class uh, just to fill some credits. And so we let them know right out of the gate. Of course, we start talking about compensation and, and you know, how, how well IT people are paid. And especially right here in Utah, right now, it's very hot market uh, in IT. And so our kids are not, not having a problem getting a job. And we're trying to, and so as some of these business kids and stuff come through one of our IT classes, we try to, you know, we try to poach them a little bit and see if we can get them into the IT program and say, look, the reason that the IT people are getting paid so well is because everybody is scared of IT and they go do something else. So if we can get people to not be afraid of IT, then we can, we can get them going. And so we try to just explain to the, get them with this idea that, look, you will always feel like you're the only one in the room that doesn't know anything. You will always feel like you're the dumbest person in the room. Get used to it, right? And I remind them, of course, even at my age, just as soon as I figured out COBOL, <laughs> they stopped using COBOL. And it's like, so you gotta, you got to do it again, right? And so you're just always learning. I mean, again, I'm preaching to the choir here, I realize. But, but this, this is kind of the, the culture we're trying to build at the colleges. These kids get, just understand you're not going to know everything. Get over it. Stop second-guessing yourself and stop worrying about you feeling like the dumbest person in the room. Just get used to it, right? Because you're probably always going to feel that way. 
and then just go figure it out. And, and it's interesting when that light turns on with the kids, they're like, oh, I, it's okay if I don't know this, and now I know how to figure it out. It's, it's fun to see, the, see that light turn. So this is kind of how we, how we do it. Um, and again, uh, LabSim is a core part of this. Uh, if the students are doing it correctly, they will have already watched the videos and done some of the labs before they come to class. Now, let's be honest, many of them, okay, most of them don't do it that way. Um, but some do, right? Some do. And the ones that get, because we use so much test out, they get very used to test out. We have a very, we, we joke we have this love-hate relationship with test out at the college. Because all the students know about test out, because they're all using it. And, uh, and they, you know, they, they joke about who, who can run the videos the fastest, right? So they'll, like, they'll be taking the train home. A lot of our students live down in Provo. So they'll take the front runner home, and they'll be watching the video on, on the train. But they'll run it at, like, you know, times three speed. So the guy's talking like, you know, and so, and, and so they joke about who can run it the fastest and still keep up and pay attention. Um, I'm actually convinced sometimes you pay attention better when you're focused on that faster speed. So I'm not sure that's a bad thing. So I'm just saying. But anyway, um, you know, we do still have discussion in class. I don't want to, in fact, if some of our adjuncts get a little too excited when we say, uh, just let them play in class, because they literally just show up, take role, and say, all right, play. And it's like, no, 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 we can't, we can't do that, right? It's not, it's not leaderless uh, projects. It, we, we need to lead the projects, and we need to have discussions. And so we usually recommend, you know, spend the first 30 minutes or, or so in class. We, our, our classes are twice a week, one and a half hours each. About the first 20, 30 minutes is some sort of a discussion about something probably coming out of test out or some key topic, whatever it is. So there is discussion, there is interaction, and the teacher can then also kind of assess who's, who's learning and who's not learning. Um, so, so we definitely will have some discussion, but, then, but, but every week we're working on some, some, some project. Sometimes the project might span a couple of weeks. It's not, a, it's not always just a, a you know, one project, one day thing. Some of them are, but some of them might take two or three weeks. We really do throw them in and kind of let them flail and swim in the deep end. It's, uh, you know, some students don't like that, but again, get comfortable being uncomfortable. So we try to stand on the sidelines with a long pole if they, if they get stuck, but, but we, we don't spend any time in the shallow end. We're pretty much throwing them in the deep end right from, right from day one. Um, we're, we're, just as an example, we're, we're into Wireshark in the networking fundamentals class. We're analyzing network traffic, right? And they're still trying to figure out what IP, how to spell IP. And, and, and we're throwing them into Wireshark and showing them how to analyze network traffic. And so it gives you kind of an idea of, of what we're talking about. Um, but then we have you know, a little more discussion, more projects, a little more discussion, continuing with the projects. And so that's, that's what we're doing. So again, the test out is all homework. It's all done off, off, offline and, and, and at home. Um, just an example of some of our uh, of some of our projects. Now, again, we're a small school, and I'm sure I probably am just like most of you guys. I have like this much budget, right? And so um, we've been very fortunate that we've been able to get some local companies, and, and even our own school, in fact, uh, started. They they donate equipment to us, right? So we've been able to get a few a few servers, some routers, and some, some switches and stuff like that. Um, I've actually I do have enough budget to buy a. I think I bought like an 80, a couple $80 switches off of Amazon a couple of years ago, some old 3,500 models. But, um, but you know, I have had to go around to local companies and say, can you donate some stuff, right? And a lot of them, when they're coming off of their books, they, they have no problem dishing out. Uh, one company, it was, a, it was an absolute blessing. Um, one company donated a, a, um, a VNX. We have a lot, of, uh, a lot of Dell hardware. I've got maybe a dozen rack mountable servers. I'm not using them all. I've got them in storage because as, as the equipment fails, I have to be able to replace them. But, um, but, we, but we're heavy VMware users. And, um, and so, you know, I pay the license. VMware has the, the license. Um, uh, you know, I, so I, 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 in my budget, I do have the, I pay the, the, the fee so that all the students can use VMware Workstation. So the way we teach the class is every student is required and expected to have a laptop. And we try to give them the right specs. They need to be a little bit beefy because we're using virtualization on them, right? And so they've got to have enough memory. They've got to have enough uh, storage. Um, <clears throat> and we, we try to dissuade them from Macs um, just because we have troubles with Macs and, and, and this stuff. Um, although not everybody gets the memo, so 
we have kids with Mac in there as well. Um, and there is VMware Fusion, which you know, works on the Mac. But again, the point of this is immersive. We're trying to get them immersed. And so right from the, even from the, uh, from the client pro class, right? Beginning in the, in the client pro class, they all, every student in, on campus in the IT program will have VMware Workstation installed on their laptop. And, uh, and, and we'll be building their first VMs. And, and again, the point of that is now we're introducing them to virtualization without them really knowing that we're introducing them to virtualization. And so, but then that also then provides an environment where they can, they can play uh, on, their, uh, you know, on their machine. And then of course, those who have Macs, they now can put Windows on top of that Mac, which of course is really what we want, and, uh, or Linux. So anyway, um, by the, by the networking class, in the Network Pro class, we are at the point where we have one of those rack-mountable servers I have dedicated running ESXi, if anybody's familiar with VMware's ESXi. We have that set up on a rack-mountable server, and, uh, and then all the students in the class can log into it remotely. They can connect to it, and then there's just a whole big sandbox for them to play in, and basically we say, all right, one of the early assignments in that class is you learned about peer-to-peer -peer networking in the client pro class, and you probably already did a peer-to-peer -peer network there, but I want you to do it again now inside of ESXi. And every student has to build their own VM, and then they all have to figure out the subnetting together, and then they all have to make sure that they you know, connect in, and then they each one go find a funny little meme that they can share with everybody else, so they do the sharing and stuff like that. Again, not a real complex project, but now we're not in simulation mode, we're in virtual mode, right? And so again, we're kind of getting the best of both worlds. The one thing I love about test out, of course, is the simulation. That's wonderful, because then I can grade it. I can grade it with the simulation. It's really tough to, to grade virtual projects because you never quite know what they did. But with a simulation environment, it's beautiful because test out just grades it for me. I don't even have to do that, right? And oh, by the way, shout out to the Edu app, test out people. We love the Edu app because it syncs all the grades, it pulls them out of test out up, and we use Canvas. And so it pulls all the grades up, uh, which was you know, life-changing for us. But anyway, so, so the, the, the simulation is wonderful while they're learning it, but the virtual world also provides an, ex, a, a, an, a, an environment for them to just go play, and if they break it, well, they gotta fix it, right? Uh, and so, <clears throat> anyway, so we use a lot of ESXi and a lot of VMware. Um, so these are just some examples on peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking. On the network, in the network uh, class, we, we introduced them to Nmap right, right out of the gate. And uh, so the other thing that we've been able to do is our college, uh, our IT department doesn't really want anything to do with us, our real IT, the school's actual IT department, wants nothing to do with us. Uh, when I started there, um, the IT program, like I said, was about three classes. So they weren't, they were, you know, and, and we were a business college and somebody didn't make the connection that business and IT actually went together, but that's a whole other discussion. So, so they had a lot of finance and a lot of accounting and a lot of business type classes, um, but when we started teaching these IT classes and we started bumping into problems with the IT department, it started bothering them and they were getting very unhappy, shall we say. And we finally talked them in to say, look, just, just isolate us, just sandbox us off and leave us alone is kind of how I pitched it. I said, if you guys will just literally firewall us out from the rest of the college, uh, leave us alone, because every time I wanted to, because when I started bringing up the ethical hacker classes, of course, that started driving them nuts, because you know I come from the cyber world, and they, they, they hadn't figured out some of their, and I probably shouldn't share some of these <laughs> stories. Anyway, we were doing things, and they didn't realize that we were doing them, shall we say. And then when they did finally figure it out, because I think I told them, uh, it freaked them all out. So anyway, we said, fine, just isolate us off and leave us alone. Couple, this does a couple of things for me. Um, number one, and they love it, by the way, so the, even the help desk now in our, each one of our classrooms, if you hit the help desk button, it rings downstairs to the help desk, except in my two lab classrooms. In my lab classrooms, when they push a button, it rings in by my office. Because the help desk literally won't come into my rooms. They're kind of like, you break it, you fix it. And we're totally fine with that because now what that does for me, it gives, it gives me an excuse to hire my own students. 
So now I have, I have a team of five right now, which are generally some of my best and my brightest. And this is becoming like the hot job on campus, especially for my international kids who can't get a job off campus, right? So they love this because this is a true full IT department. They have to build up servers. I've got my, you know, we've had some racks actually don donated to us. So I've got racks, I've got servers to throw in there. They have to figure out the networking. They have to configure the switches. They have to configure the routers. They, they're still trying to figure out a firewall. It's been five years and we haven't got a real actual working firewall going yet, which isn't, a, I, I mean, I, I'm not running this lab in best, using best practices. I just say that right up front. But, but the fact is, for five years, these students, employees of mine, have been trying to figure out the best way to put this firewall in there. And they've, they've done it, and it breaks things, and then they pull it out, and then they try it again. Anyway, we're getting really, really close. We've just about got our, uh, in our cybersecurity uh, track, we um, just about have our SOC built. So it's literally being built by all my students. So it's wonderful, because they're, again, the few that I can hire, I can't hire all of them, obviously, but the few that I can hire, they're learning how to do this stuff. And they have deadlines, because by darn, if that system isn't running by Tuesday morning when, you know, a Professor so-and-so needs that ESXi running, dude, I'm not taking the heat for that. That's, that's what I pay you for. I, I pretend I'm my old boss. I pat him on the head, and I smile and say, well, this is, this is why I pay you. Figure it out. And I've had students literally stay until like one or two in the morning trying to get something to, something to work because the teacher needs it at, at nine o'clock that next morning. Um, we run a little cyber competition on, on campus where we invite uh, local high school teams to come and, and we host a red team, blue team competition. And again, my students have to build it all out and it better work because these students are paying customers to come. You know, they pay us a few bucks to cover the cost of the food and the t-shirts and stuff, but it better work. And if it doesn't work, it's not my job. I'm just the boss. I sit in my room and you know, eat snacks. They, they're the ones that have to fix it. So um, anyway, this is just an example of some of the projects that we do. Uh, they have to run Nmap. And because I have this environment, by the way, this is kind of what got me off on this conversation. Because I have this environment, when we run Nmap, it's legit. I say, discover my environment. Dis I've got a whole network in here. I've got domain controllers. I've got FTP servers. I've got web servers. Find everything. You tell me what you find. And they're like, uh, what? And the first question, obviously, is, is, is you know, we download an, an Nmap, and uh, well, they use Zen Map because of the GUI interface. And so they, they run their scan, and they're looking at it, and the first thing they, f they have to figure out is, well, what's my target? Right? What's my target? I don't know. What do you want to scan? Well, I don't know. Well, we just learned about subnets and IP addressing, and you gonna scan the entire internet? Well, no. All right, so where do we start? Uh, they, they kind of say, probably somebody says, well, should we scan our own network? I said, yeah, what is it? And then somebody, somebody finally says, IP config. I'm like, yes, IP config. And then they run IP config and figure out what network they're on and start there, <laughs> right? And so again, this is why we love the virtual world too. Uh, and, and so we can, they're learning the, the concepts in the, in the, uh, uh, in the um, um, simulation world, but in class we're playing in the virtual world. So they can break stuff and do whatever they want. And you know, the, the, the first real experience from them, uh, and this is, this is a perfect example where the simulation sometimes, it teaches them what we need them to learn, but they miss some things because the simulation kind of skips over a few things. So the first time they actually have to run Active Directory in a VM, okay? Now they've learned all about VM through test out and lab sim, and they know it cold. They can set up users, groups, the permissions, all that stuff. But w the first time we make them actually build their own VM in Windows Server and say, okay, now turn Active Directory on and create users, they're like, well, how do I do that, right? It's like, well, geez, I don't know. <laughs> you gotta go install Active Directory. Um, anyway, so, Let's see, I think we're getting about at the end. We, we spent a lot of time in Cali in our, in our security pro class. Again, because they're learning all the security pro stuff on, at home, that gives us time in class to play with Cali. So we introduce them to all the different things in Cali. So they're learning that right from, the, right from that, first, uh, that first security class. Um, and in, uh, IDS, in that same class, in the uh, security, pro, so security pro class, um, in fact, we just started it last week. We're on our last couple of weeks of our semester. And we just started the IDS project, which means, again, 
one full dedicated ESXi box, and we have a pre-built Alien Vault IDS uh, VM already running, and everybody has to bring up a new uh, Windows or Linux VM. We don't care, just pick one. And then they have to figure out how to install the HIDs on that box and add it into the Alien Vault thing. So <clears throat> again, because we can do these projects in class, uh, it, it makes it really, really powerful. These are just some of the products that we use. Uh, so a lot of VMware, Alien Vault, you'll notice most of it's open source stuff, right? <laughs> again, because I have, no, uh, I have no real budget. I do pay for the Azure license and I do pay for the VMware license out of my budget. But then, so that's how, so the, the kids can get access to all the Microsoft ISOs and, and, uh, and ESXi and anything else that they need. Um, these are some of the companies around here who are hiring our students. Like I said, we had a great pipeline with EMC for, for several years where they were hiring just a boatload of our students and, uh, uh, and, and taking them in. We're, we're now, um, when Dell took them over, that changed a little bit, so we, we've got a couple. But I only need two or three partners. I don't need 100, 100 companies. It makes it really, really nice. So um, I hopefully had a f few minutes left for any questions and answers. I don't know if any of you have any questions or would want any of my answers, but here we go. Yeah. I, we do very similar things in our community college in New Mexico. Um, a lot of what you're doing is exactly what we're doing. We have same struggles. Um, I also teach the internship class, so I polish them up before they take off. Yeah. It sounds like you're able to pay your, your students. I'm real curious about how you're getting them paid, because I would love to do that. Yes, uh, I am able to pay them. They, they, they're not paid as well as off-campus jobs, but I can pay them something. And that, that is, again, for my international students, that's, that's life-changing. These poor kids can't get a job off-campus, and since we're so small, there's just not that many on-campus jobs. But yes, we are fortunate that we've been able to negotiate an arm wrestle and name call and argue and punt. Anyway, we've been able to get some, some money to pay uh, for some of these interns, uh, no, no, for, for students. Now, what my plan is with the SOC is to turn that into an on-campus internship that will be unpaid, all right? So once I get my SOC running, because we've got a, an incident response course that I want them to learn how to you know, run, a, we're using Splunk, and so we want them to be able to do incident response. We have a, a, a company here in town that, that is a SOC, uh, SOC as a service solution. And so we're trying to build a relationship. They've already hired about, uh, about eight or nine of our kids now. And so that's our next pipeline. And so I want these guys SOC ready, right? So the point there is I'm not going to pay th these kids because I'm going to allow this. Uh, I've now made an internship a requirement. Beginning fall semester this year, uh, every student in the cyber program has to do an internship. Well, not everyone's going to be able to find one, so I've, I, I have to kind of create an opportunity so that I can provide some on-campus ones if they can't get one off-campus. But these will be unpaid. Yeah. So um, where is your SOC? Do you have like a room for it? Do you have a room for the SOC? Or? Yes, we've, uh, yes we, we've really upset our facilities group. I've taken over four rooms that are not designed to be an IT center, data center. Uh, but they are now, uh, and uh, I, we had we measured 117 degrees a couple summers ago in one of the rooms. I mean, hardware was was melting. So, um, but yeah, we've just kind of taken over some rooms. I, I, I'm a little bit, you know, forgiveness is easier than permission kind of a thing. So I've just kind of taken them over, and by the time I'm up and running, and somebody upstairs realizes what I've done, I'm like, yeah, but it's really working great. And they're like, well, yeah, it kind of is. So, I shouldn't say that. I hope that's not on video. So th this is a great question. So the question was, is if we're firewalled off, what traffic are we actually catching? Great question. So our solution is, first of all, we have pen testing classes, right? So we are doing some of that. But also one of my paid employees, I just now s separated my, my team into two groups. So I've got my main data center team, which is five, five students, and I just hired my first my sixth student, which is now going to be heading my SOC, he's kind of my, my SOC team lead. And his job, because he's paid and I now own him, right? I can now control him. Uh, his job will be to come up with simulation, or he'll generate traffic as needed. So, so right now what I've got him doing is kind of building a library of different attacks. And, and my thought is, is for the internship, what I'm going to do is the, the, the kids have to meet a schedule. So they have to show up, and I've got a TA that will be checking them in and checking them out as if they were getting paid, right? This is this your check your time clock in, time clock out. Although I'm not paying them, but uh, at the end of each at the end of each 
um, shift, they need to turn in their incident reports, whatever it is they were researching. And if my, if my team lead guy is sending out certain attacks, we know what they should be seeing, right? And so then we can kind of assess and measure whether or not they're finding the stuff or not. So that's, we've, not, we've not implemented that yet. That's beginning in the fall. But that's our, that's our plan. I've just got this kid hired last month, and so that's what he's working on right now. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to ask that we get firewalled because I'm teaching a Cisco class. We do pings and, and trace routes, and I can't, I can't show them because we can't get at them. You can't get at them. I can ping from my room to one more router, and that's it. Yeah. And do a trace route all the way there and back. I get one hop. And it's this has been life-changing for us. This has been life-changing for us. And, and like I said, it puts a lot more pressure now on me and my students because if it's broke, they ain't coming down to help us. And they've, they're almost blunt about it. They're like, not our problem. I would be happy. Yeah, it, but, it, but, it, but it actually makes it real world now. Because now, and because I, because I am paying them, I have a little leverage over these students, right? So I'm like, no, you're on my payroll. I'm not your teacher right now, I'm your boss. And that needs to be fixed by tomorrow morning. So, so that's real world, right? I mean, any of us who've ever worked in an IT department, that's the pressure you feel on a daily basis. The server's down. I have no idea why, and I've got to fix it. So it's been life-changing to, 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 to do that. It took a little negotiation, but actually, once we said that, that you know, if, if you fire Wallace off, you will never have to come down here, that sold, it, that sold them on it. I'm kind of proud of the, uh, the help desk ticket that uh, got back to me. It said, uh, Professor Shotway is uh, teaching ethical hacking, and uh, we have to re reconfigure the router for his room. Yeah. And once I tried to well, this is another reason I really am anxious to get my sock up and running because I'm sure I've got students breaking into stuff already, and I don't and I can't see them yet, so I need to see them. Sock? What is what, that? Sock. What's that? I mean, it's something. Security. I'm sorry, Security Operations Center. Thank you. So, so Security Operations Center. This is where all the network traffic and all the IDS traffic. I told you we we introduced IDS in our in our uh, Security Pro class. All the IDS traffic, network traffic, firewall logs, everything gets forwarded up into this, what they call the SIM, the Security Information Event Manager System, which is like the, the, you know, the, the Houston NASA data center with all the screens in the front room. Right now I've only got two screens, but I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to get like six to eight screens in there. And, and so the students have to analyze all that traffic and tell us, was that an attack or was that not an attack? And uh, the, they're, here in Salt Lake, we've got a half a dozen SOC as a service companies popping up. So they're going to be a really good employer for us. Because it's kind of an entry level security job. Like tech support is into IT, SOC, SOC security analyst layer level one is an entry level security job. OK, I think I'm out of time. Thank you so much for letting me spend some time with you. Appreciate this.